on chips, chain link mouth, boots on wheels. Heart of steel, feet don't move, yellow chest, curling rise. Hello and welcome to another edition of Perseverance Records Interviews. I'm Rob Esterhammer, here with uh, Charles Bernstein and Wes Craven, respectively the composer and the writer and director of A Nightmare on Elm Street and Deadly Friend, although uh, Wes did not write Deadly Friend. That was scripted by Bruce Joel Rubin, who also scripted Ghost. Uh, thank you for joining us today, gentlemen. My pleasure. Same here. Excellent. Uh, let's get right into it. Uh, thinking back to the early 1980s, how did your paths first cross? How did you meet? Wes? Well, uh, you know, obviously uh, we had uh, done the picture and we were looking for somebody to, um, you know, to bring a score to it that would uh, give it a distinctive flavor. And, um, you know, um, I think among just kind of fishing out there and putting out the word and talking to people, we heard about Charles and um, I had an interview with him and was impressed, very much impressed by him, and, um, you know, it just felt like we could work together. We were kind of fellow spirits. I don't know, speaking for myself, Charles, but that's how it felt. Yeah, that's my recollection, too. I, <clears throat> I remember being in Santa Barbara and getting a call from Charlie Ryan, who was my agent at that time, and he said, you know, there's this guy, Wes Craven. I think I, I think you guys would really hit it off. He's an intellectual. <laughs> 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 and I said... Uh, well, that sounds great. Uh, we're speaking about our first meeting, which was Nightmare on Elm Street. Nightmare on Elm Street, correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, so, yeah, that's pretty much my recollection. I went down there, really liked the guy, and uh, he spoke really uh, cogently and intelligently about the film. You know, he was uh, talking about the script and what they were looking for and how he liked to work. And... Uh, so, yeah, I felt real comfortable at that point, and uh, things went forward. Excellent. Now, the first Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, the film and the score, were among the first and probably the best that firmly established the creepy association of the nursery lullaby and horror. Mm. What sort of discussions did you have over uh, using that idea, and whose idea was that? I'd like to get Jump both of your opinion one. on that. I remember uh, Wes and I got started on the picture, and it was about a third of the way through. I was I was sort of sketching ideas and doing things, and I had the feeling that it would be nice to have a theme, an actual melody, uh, because so many uh, quote unquote horror movies, you know, they had scary music and uh, menacing music and hectic music and whatnot, but not many of them had like an overarching. Uh, set of themes, and I came to Wes, and um, I played him the uh, da da dee da 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 da. You know that that mm -hmm. theme, and then there was a little accompaniment thing dee da dee da, which was based on the uh, jump rope. Yes, and at the beginning, kind of a nursery rhyme: one, two, buckle your shoe. And uh, I didn't think Wes was going to go for the melody idea for some reason. And he just jumped at it. He said, yeah, that's really cool. That's going to, you know, really contribute to the film. And it kind of gave me a green light to just move forward on that. Fabulous. It was rather uh, funny because the, um, the little ditty, One, Two, Freddy's Coming for You, I wrote in the script, um, 
almost as a joke, you know, just I, I didn't know whether that ever, anything would ever become of that. And um, I think there were many people that read it and said, well, you'll take that out eventually. <laughs> but uh, the tune that that uh, Charles came up with was so perfect for that that mm-hmm. um, it became actually a, a big a big moment. And if I'm not mistaken, we shot that um, that little jump rope scene at the very, very end of shooting, um, I think the last day, when we um, shot kind of the ending that Bob Shea wanted uh, as far as the kids going off in the car. And we, we shot the little girl's jump rope right in, and put it in there, and it was just, it just incredibly, it worked incredibly well. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Now, you mentioned that uh, the alternate ending, the new ending, uh, can you tell us what ending you had planned for the movie originally? Well, it wasn't hugely different. It was, the original was that she just came back, uh, the mother was obviously alive, and, and Nancy kind of went down the walk and went off to school uh, in this very dense fog, and um, that was just kind of, le- you were left with not knowing if it was a dream or, or w- what exactly it was. And uh, there were two two things that, that happened. One, Bob Shea very early on saw the possibilities of a sequel, uh, which I did not, frankly. Um, and so he wanted to have some kind of a hook for a sequel. And so I came up with this idea of the kids driving off in the car. And, and Bob Bob wanted Freddie to be driving the car, and I refused. I said, L- I'll put a, a roof on the car that, <laughs> you know, has Freddie's color. No, but the other funny roof. thing was that when we went off to shoot my version of it, because he said you can shoot both versions, uh, with our limited budget, we found it absolutely impossible to fog up the entire street. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> the few times we tried, the wind would come up and quickly blow the smoke away. Oh, no. Um, I, being the practical person that any director is, you say, well, you know what, it probably will work the way uh, with a combination of the two things. So that's um, what we ended up with. Excellent. Great. Uh, it was about uh, two years uh, till Deadly Friend came along. Was there a shorthand uh, in communication uh, that you could capitalize on, such as in spotting the picture? Uh, yeah, I, I recall, uh, you know, Wes had some really practical and, uh, for me, unprecedented uh, uh, shorthand ways of communicating, uh, which actually never, uh, no one I had subsequently worked with had, had come up with. Uh, we had kind of divided uh, the score into what you might call exclamations and sentences, although I don't think those were the words we used at the time. That's the way I thought of them. They were things that punctuated and things that sort of carpeted. And uh, we actually came to the dubbing stage with those elements separated. So Wes could punctuate with musical uh, elements uh, at a different, in other words, come in at a shocking level that would be different from the level the other music was playing at. So if if uh, Freddie, for instance, were to pop out, uh, you know, uh, from some place, or if in Deadly Friend uh, there was something that happened uh, that, that uh, Wes wanted to jar the audience, he would be able to manipulate that separate sound uh you know, in a different way from the other. So we, uh, I think we called them stingers uh, for the separate sounds. Even right. though they weren't stingers, but, you know, they were all kinds of different things. And then, uh, you know, the basic scoring elements. Was there a difference in scoring uh, electronically and scoring with a full orchestra in regards to that, to those stingers? Well, you know... It's interesting. You have to put your mind back to first the year 1983 and then the year 1986, I think, is when we started on the other. Uh, The world then was very different for a composer. Now it's sort of assumed that everybody has a private studio and a public studio where we work in our private realm and then we go into an orchestra studio. In addition, in those days, especially in Nightmare on Elm Street, it was pretty unprecedented that composers had private studios and that one was done exclusively in a private you know in a home studio uh deadly friend was divided pretty much equally between recording i believe it was at warner brothers with a you know decent sized orchestra and elements from the home studio and uh elements of the two combined it was the first time for me that i used the uh, home studio elements in combination 
in any degree with uh, with an orchestra. There was sort of a whole synthetic uh, world that had been created by various musicians, including some classical musicians of you know the Moog and uh, computer synthetic music and everything else. But uh, there was also um, a tendency of some uh, composers to try to use uh, electronic versions of acoustic mm -hmm. instruments, for instance, fake violins and so forth. And right. I felt those really sounded terrible. So whenever we would use synthetic music, it was always used in a way that you could clearly tell it was synthetic. But there is, in some way, something kind of a little alien and soulless and scary about synthetic music. So that, uh, you know, when we were able to actually have enough budget to bring in some acoustic instruments and record it in a normal studio, it made for an interesting combination. You could kind of use those two different textures to, um, you know, go from something that's perhaps a little bit more reassuring and normal feeling to something that was quite alien and bizarre by but using it, something that you could actually afford more, which was electronic music. Yeah, as, as Wes says that, I, I'm starting to recall now uh, our, some of our conversations about that. Um, I remember, uh, Wes, uh, you very much liked the idea. Uh, there were a few cues, one of which I think was the Thanksgiving dinner, and there were some others earlier in the picture that helped establish kind of a more, as you say, a normalcy, almost a uh, 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 a acoustic standard orchestral flavor against which the uh, the more electronic BB, uh, you know, sounds uh, kind of created an interesting texture. I remember uh, particularly that dinner scene, uh, you saying, I very much want to create a very, you know, warm family feeling here so that when we go into the other music, it'll have a, a, a very definite contrast to it. Right. Yeah, I think in those days, the electronic music in, in films was uh, was a lot less uh, ordinary and was kind of um, a little bit threatening, a little off-putting, a little strange compared to you know, today when it's quite common. So it had that kind of nice element of uh, bringing something quite different to the... As long as it wasn't trying to pretend to be something else, which I never liked. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think it also works quite well with the with the um, threatening character of of BB Sam. Um, it was the electronic music worked quite well representing that character. Uh, that was something I liked about the movie, and you had the more orchestral music for the relationship between Sam and um, I forget his name now, the main character. Uh, but I think that worked quite well in the picture. Was that something that you guys had planned? Yeah, I think so. That, uh, you know, BB being sort of having human qualities, but not really being uh, human, but, but mm -hmm. a machine, that uh, kind of his world was more, you know, of that sort of music also. And that in a way it becomes his, his, his light motive, if you would, <laughs> speaking yeah. in like yeah. Wagnerian terms of just sort of this kind of stood for. You can see why I got along immediately with Wes. He, he was using phrases like leitmotif, which is a Wagnerian opera term <laughs> for bringing back themes. Sorry. Uh, no, I love that. Uh, actually, I do remember being heavily influenced by Laurie Anderson really? around that time and mentioning that to Wes. And I, I told him I'd love to do a song at the end which I actually ended up staying for the most part in the picture, um, which was kind of a, a collage montage, a sound montage of of the word BB. And then we did sort of a Laurie Anderson overlay, which wasn't in the movie, but um, uh, with a, a kind of woman's voice uh, reciting things like, uh, you know, little phrases of metallic elements. Uh, yeah, like that, runs on wheels word. and f feeds on chips and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, I, you know, I came from an academic background um, long before I ever thought of making movies. I was a, a college professor and I I taught in a um, in a town that had a, also a state university in it that um, was, was very strong in music. So a lot of my friends were either music teachers or students who were there. So I, I got a great introduction not only to, um, to blues and to, uh, you know, everything else that was pop, but also to Stockhausen and John Cage and all sorts of strange things that I found quite fascinating that, in, you know, I never would have run across otherwise, but I did have that 
and a rich background of uh, being around a lot of smart people and learning a lot from them. You know, it's interesting, uh, uh, Wes, you mentioned uh, Stockhausen and John Cage. It occurs to me those are two styles of composition that could be but haven't been uh, used even to this date in any degree in in, uh, film scoring. So that's kind of interesting. Is that also uh, where you got your inspiration for your only non-horror movie? Uh, well, you know, that, that came from a lot of aspects of my life, but certainly the teaching aspect uh, was was one of the reasons uh, that I was so drawn to that. Uh, if you're speaking about music of the heart. Music of the heart, yeah. Was that, uh, you know, I had I had been a teacher. Um, I did love classical music. Uh, I had lived in New York and had a love affair with New York. And, uh, and I also had gone through, just speaking personally, a divorce as a child since my parents got divorced. And then also when I was an adult, I had gone through you know one or two of my own so it, there were a lot of things about that picture that just spoke to things that were very personal mm-hmm. yeah, i love that picture by the way thank you well, did you ast- attend the scoring sessions wes oh sure excellent did you did you have any uh feedback was or were, were there many changes on the scoring stage or i know that's always something that's very expensive and that producers try to avoid. well i think when charles avoid. and i were working together we had less time i i, I think we spent much more time at his house you know, listening to pieces of music and, and talking about, you know, possible changes or additions or whatever, by the time we got on the scoring stage, I think we pretty much, I, I don't remember the particulars of, of anything on a scoring stage except being delighted that it was actually uh, getting recorded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, yeah, Wes was in the booth, uh, very supportive. Uh, you know, uh, there were no surprises on Deadly Friend. Um, the I do recall we... We did, uh, you know, the, the issue of blending orchestra with um, with pre-existing electronic stuff. Uh, the one area where the electronic stuff actually was generated in the orchestra session was in the main title. Uh, West sort of felt that the orchestral cue, once he heard it, you know, the main title cue, which is very melodic and kind of, um, you know, not horror-ish, uh, that there should be some electronic element, and we added a synthesized pulse with the orchestral cue kind of on the spot, uh, and we brought it to the dubbing stage, I think, as an option, which we ended up using a kind of da 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 yeah, right. Yeah, that just kind of, you know, gave a little presence to that, which incidentally brings up another issue that just popped into my head, and that's the the element of preparation or kind of preparing the audience for things that may not be happening at the moment the music is playing, but that will happen later in the film and the music should do something earlier so that when it happens, it feels welcome. I mean, it could still be a surprise. Like a foreshadowing element? Yeah, just enough. For instance, at the very beginning of Deadly Friend, as I watched it last night, uh, at the very beginning... Before that main title, there's a, a kind of graphic title uh, sequence, very short, that precedes the, the main title sequence. I believe it was added, but I can't remember for sure. And we foreshadowed in that the depth of the elements of horror that would come later, so that when they came, it wasn't a complete emotional surprise to the audience in a bad, <clears throat> in a bad way. It was kind of a, a welcome development because it had been, as you say, foreshadowed. I do recall that. Uh, is that something that you also used on Nightmare on Elm Street? Well, I think in, in any, well, certainly in the films that that I make, you you prepare the audience for events, as Charles was saying, sometimes 20 minutes, half an hour ahead of when they're actually going to happen because mm-hmm. you, you need to kind of, it's a little bit like uh, you're, you're guiding the Titanic. You never, you can't move an audience quickly, you know, but you're a little tug, so you it's all about little nudges in certain directions until finally you have them where you, <laughs> where you want them. Mm-hmm. So uh, you can't just, um, you know, either with music or anything else in, in, in this kind of a film, if you're doing it just, uh, you know, moments before it happens, uh, you know, trying to affect the audience, it doesn't work nearly as well as if you are preparing the audience subtly. Um, so that there are all sorts of tensions and, and expectations um, that are either, you know, satisfied or confuted long before you actually get to the point. You know, I did notice last night when I was watching the movie, I I noticed uh, the composer, that is myself, I was watching it as a 
you know, objective, hopefully to some degree anyway, objective observer. And I noticed uh, the composer introducing elements of darkness early when, you know, the picture begins with no darkness. You know, the story is, yeah. is quite free of, of dark elements. Uh, but the music began to, you know, slowly uh, bring in menacing elements mixed. And Wes, in his uh, direction, I noticed do that as well. He introduced a dream sequence of the uh, kind of sadistic, dangerous father of the girl. And uh, you don't, <laughs> in the fashion of Nightmare on Elm Street, you don't know it's a dream, but as it goes along, it starts to become more and more surreal. And it introduces a very dark image of uh, him being stabbed, and then she wakes up. But just the introduction of that dark image early makes you willing to go along with the dark images that will come later, even though the picture begins in a rather benign, uh, easy kind of fashion. I see. Nightmare on Elm Street had a pretty uh, pregnant theme um, the one that you mentioned earlier, that da 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 da, uh, there was not so much a theme in uh, Deadly Friend. There was a, a, there were a few smaller ones, minor ones, but there was not really a, a light motif to quote. Uh, was was that a um, a conscious choice, or was it something that just happened during scoring? Rob, there actually is, but the nature of of the. Um the progression of that film there 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 is actually when you if you go back and listen to or watch the film there there are a set of themes that do sort of unify the score even though the score is bifurcated in that way we spoke of between electronic and acoustic mm -hmm. uh there there are melodic uh, themes that kind of persist in both the the electronic and in the uh, acoustic realm, but they're just not as memorable. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, there's something, the Nightmare on Elm Street theme, I think, was used more um, more prominently and more frequently. I remember Maurice Jarre telling me that when he did uh, uh, Dr. Zhivago, that theme that we all remember, Laura's theme, when he originally wrote it, it was not all over the picture, but as they kept cutting the picture down, it was cut down to scenes that had that theme in it, and pretty soon it became very memorable. So one of the lessons I learned with that is uh, if you use it more often in different ways, it's much more effective. And I mm -hmm. had a few different themes in Deadly Friend. Uh, probably if there was just one main one, as there was in Nightmare on Elm Street, it would have been more uh, noticeable or prominent. There's also been, uh, you know, there were seven more iterations of the Nightmare movie, so you heard the theme a lot just in your lifetime. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. repetition is, uh, in film music, is a good thing, uh, as long as it isn't monotonous repetition. Yes. And I think it was also uh, uh, used for the Freddy Krueger character to, to introduce him or to, to foreshadow him in certain ways, whereas uh, in Deadly Friend you didn't have that... You you didn't have that that menacing character until rather late in the picture, about halfway through the picture. Uh, so there was really no need for a a villain's theme, as it were. Yeah, yeah. It's always good when you have that off-screen villain too, like the shark in Jaws, in Jaws or Freddy yeah. Krueger, where he's not is he doesn't have as much screen time, but he looms large off-screen. If you know what I mean. Yes. Yes. Definitely. But the music can kind of represent him when he's not visually present. There's also the factor, I think, just to be extremely honestly, is that, you know, a theme like Freddy's theme comes along not that often, you know, yeah, that's where just true. everything works, and, and even you don't even know it until years later that the thing just, uh, you know, somehow resonates in everybody's mind and they can't mm -hmm. get it out of their head. I think every film I've made, I've always you know, told one composer or another, I, I want something like Freddy's theme, but you don't <laughs> often get it. You know, I think Charles just came up with something quite phenomenal, and uh, it was pretty instantly recognizable. It, it's kind of a, a object lesson for, for me, which I have to keep reminding myself, how much an audience appreciates a thematic element that you can walk away from a picture with. Frankly, it's a lot easier for a composer to write music that's non-thematic because that you don't have to make that commitment to theme. Right. And it can be done more quickly and much more easily. And we are all, 
in some degree lazy folk. I, I am. If, I, if there's an easier way to do something, I'd rather do that. But I think the lesson that keeps popping up for me is it's worth the time and effort to try to find the key, you know, find that, that thematic key that, uh, that'll click with a picture. It can it's just, uh, it, it just raises the picture up to a, I mean, if you think of, uh, you know, Psycho, the theme from Psycho, I mean, it's just like, you know, instantly you can recall it and it, it is the film in a way, or, or the third man theme. It's, they're, they're just things that become yeah. synonymous with the film. And as a filmmaker, it's just, um, if the audience goes out of the, theater with a, 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 a sound, a film, a, 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 I mean, a, a song, sort of a theme that they can't get out of their head, it's like they'll whistle it in class the next day, you know, or, or they'll, they'll talk about it, or it'll, it'll play on the radio. I mean, there's a, it, it just takes the, the whole life of the film and, and kind of brings it out of the theater into uh, wherever that audience goes in a way that, um, you know, it wouldn't otherwise. So it, it's, when it happens, it's, a, it's a really quite a magical thing. Yeah, Wes is so right about that, too. I, I, uh, I've been noticing that up until a certain year in film history, themes were kind of, you know, the rule rather than the, the exception. And I think in the last, you know, the current uh, maybe decade or even longer, uh, it, it's been uh, waning. And now it's very rare it, even in big, you know, Hollywood films, uh, successful, you know, uh, uh, blockbuster and whatnot, to, to actually walk away from any of them with a piece of the music in your heart, you know, a piece of the music that represents the film. So let's hope maybe there'll be a, a, a renaissance, <laughs> you know. Did any of you read uh, Diana Hansel's book, uh, Friend for Inspiration? Uh, I certainly read it uh, at the beginning because, uh, you know, I wanted to see what, story was basically uh it was fairly different uh, there, uh, even with a simple book like that that is a book written for young adults it's you can't put it all into a movie and and quite often there are things that are simply um literate rather than cinematic mm-hmm. you know the interior of what characters think and so forth uh, doesn't go very far in a film so you always start there but then you try to uh, almost immediately disassociate yourself from it because you know you have to make an entirely different creature. On that thought, I did not read the book, but as I was watching the picture last night, I became very aware of elements that I'm assuming were not in the book, but that were very um, actually directorial in nature that made me think about the relationship between humor and horror, or for lack of another word, uh, the idea of... I think Hitchcock definitely had that... uh, that thing and, and Wes was doing it all the way through this picture. It was uh, such an interesting thing. Little things like uh, when the kid puts the sleeping potion in his mom's coffee, and it's not sinking. You know, it, uh, it even reminded me a little bit of Psycho in, in some ways, where the car wouldn't sink, yeah. but where the audience is kind of hanging on small details. And there's definitely, I mean, I found myself giggling a couple of times involuntarily with uh, these little humorous touches that kind of uh, make, I don't know, make the whole, uh, when things happen that are, you know, gruesome, it somehow makes them more acceptable, more palatable. Uh, You don't feel like you're being assaulted, but rather teased. And it's just kind of an interesting uh, It also just makes it real, you know. I mean, the Hitchcock example is is perfect because... You know, uh, oh, he's going to put the car in the swamp. And in any other movie, any other direction movie, it would, like, sink burple, burple, and disappear. <laughs> but the Hitchcock one, the damn thing, yeah. you know, it becomes an out-out damn spot moment yeah. where uh, he, he's human, you know. And yeah. it, it's there was a great moment in one of his other films where somebody was trying to get a ring off a corpse and they couldn't get it off and had to break the finger. It's just like that really... Um, it dislocates the audience in a way because they they think that they know what's going to happen, and they don't. And the audience is always trying to assure themselves that okay, this is very scary, but I know how this is going to turn out. And so what you have to do is subvert that, yeah. and e- you can even use a cliche but turn it on its head at the last moment, and that's quite disquieting to an audience. And it's also just fun. I mean, it's what a joke does. I mean, you when somebody tells you a joke, um, you think you're going to be able to guess what what the punchline is, and if it's a good joke, it comes from a totally different direction. And Hitchcock always did that, and, I, and I've always been fascinated with, with that in my films, and I think a good composer also does that. 
Yeah, it's like when the mom, you know, we think the mom's dead <laughs> the next morning because she, she's not waking up, and they, they're shaking her, and, and, you know, then when she wakes up, there's this exactly like at the end of a joke, kind of a punchline relief, you know, everybody kind of laughs because she, she is alive. And I, uh, Wes, I think you got a lot of mileage out of the, the kid who's his friend, you know, <laughs> this wonderful things are just keeling over, you know, and, right. you know, it's just, uh, yeah, a lot of that stuff. It gives the picture, a, it, as you say, a certain naturalness, but it also makes it enjoyable. You know, it's fun to laugh. You know, and and kind of be teased a little bit with these things. I I, I think it's one of the things that may help make me a name director, if I may say so, is that you have that kind of personal relationship with the audience, where you never assume that they're just going to be interested by anything you do, and that you actually have to kind of, you know, have a personal conversation with them about whatever is going on to the screen so that they have a feeling like this person is speaking specifically to me and this is all fresh. Mm-hmm. But you don't feel like you're just getting some sort of series of cliché moments. Mm-hmm. That they become very personal because you say, oh, that, that director has a personality. He started me down the path and I thought I knew where he was going to take me, but then he surprised me. Audiences really like that. Or even if you want to scare an audience, and I think this happens again with film also, where you can start with, uh, you know, a score or, or a moment in the score where it's very benign or, or almost lulling, and then at a certain point you just kind of hit them from a direction that they, they weren't expecting. You know, it, uh, I had a teacher, Roy Harris, a great American composer, and I remember he had a phrase for that. He used to say, create an expectation in your listener and then satisfy that expectation in an unexpected way. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. which I think happens throughout Deadly Friend. Uh, you know, I was uh, just noticing how many times I was I was kind of giggling that giggle of recognition when something uh, clicked into place, you know. So. Well, there's always a, you know, a certain moment where somebody's walking down the hallway or whatever and the audience knows, okay, something's going to happen. Yeah. Um, unless the director's going to take the, the, you know, the, the thing of not having anything happen. But that's always kind of disappointing. But what as a director... You're constantly second-guessing the audience, and I think a composer also does it, of what do they expect and how long can I keep them on the hook without them just walking away in disgust? Yeah. Or, you know, you have to give some signal like, you know what, nothing's going to happen, and then the next split second, you you hit them. Yeah, and exactly. But after a while, they know that pattern, so then you have to somehow subvert that. So it's always this constant uh, uh, game with the audience. I noticed in Deadly Friend, uh, when the girl goes back to her house and her dad is not in his place, you know, he's supposed, he was watching TV and kind of uh, sleeping on the couch, mm-hmm. and the music, I, I vaguely recall us discussing how to treat the menace there, because that's that's one of those moments where, okay, you don't know where the dad is, he may pop out of anywhere at any time, and she kind of goes up the stairs, and there's one of those... Uh, enticingly tight shots where you can't, you don't know if he's just outside of the frame of the picture and about to, you know, leap out at her. And uh, it's just kind of a delicious sequence that's, uh, you know, kind of you can savor it. She goes in the house, she walks up the stairs. You know, where is he? Uh, what's going to happen? You know. So yeah, that's it's, that's such fun musically to be able to work with that. Excellent. Now that we've talked about the past, let's take a minute to talk about the future. What's up for you guys next? Charles? Okay. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm working on a, a... Actually, I just finished a remake of Sybil. Uh, which, which is also coming out on this label. Uh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> just did a little bit of self-promotion here. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's actually seven films. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Seven uh, films, yeah. And uh, that... Um, it has not yet aired as we have this interview, and the I'm do, working on an independent feature now with a writer director who's a wonderful writer but first time director, which is interesting when you've worked with someone say like Wes, who's a writer director and who's been, you know, at it and really you know been working his craft for quite a long time. Composers very often find themselves. This is true of me and my colleagues as well working with first-timers, because there are a lot of first-time directors and writers, and to hang on the way Wes has year after year, you know, making hits, is by far the exception. And a lot of guys get one shot at it, and, you know, then they're, uh, for whatever reason, uh, don't get a second. So 
as I say, we work with a lot of first-time directors. This guy's quite terrific, though, and it, it's uh, always refreshing to, to kind of uh, delve into a new, uh, whole new set of uh, issues. And it's, uh, so that's, it's called Bull Run, and that's what I'm working on at the moment. Mm-hmm. Wes, are you flying to Morocco? Yes, I'm flying to Morocco in about a week. I have a film, you know, as you probably know, uh, a sequel to a remake of The Hills of Eyes, which is shooting right now in Morocco. They're about halfway through. Um, which I co-wrote with my son, which was a, a fun experience. Oh. oh, wow. And so that that's uh, one thing I'm involved in. And I'm also, um, right now I'm in, I have a kind of a vacation or a summer home uh, on the East Coast uh, on one of the islands, and I'm writing um, the first film that I've actually, uh, that I'll write and direct uh, since, I think, uh, The New Nightmare, which was 94, so... After that, I sort of got into the Scream series and uh, wrote a novel and did a lot of other things, scripts by other terrific writers, but I've, I've just got an idea right now, so I'm uh, sitting down to write it and then probably be directing it next spring. Fabulous. Well, I want to thank you both, Wes and Charles, for taking the time to speak with us. It's a great treat for me, Rob. Gave us a chance to visit, even though by long distance with Wes. So. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Okay. This is Robin Estehammer. Signing off until the next interview.